The Curious Criminal Casebook Compendium of Victorian Detective Memoirs and Other Stories Written and read by Adrian Lee As I sit here in the twilight of my years, I wish to document for you the strange and bizarre events that were my life. Looking back at my career in isolation, I feel that the historical facts of the 19th century have been reflected in a Victorian funhouse mirror. Thus, these memoirs read like a cross between a H.G. Wells novel and a Sherlock Holmes serialization. I guess that copying from one person is stealing, but copying from everyone is research. My name is Frederick Eugene Trevella. I was born in Devizes in 1820, a small market town and civil parish in Wiltshire, England. My family came from a long line of clockmakers, but I showed a greater ambition and travelled to London at the tender age of 16 to enlist with the Metropolitan Police Force, where I was appointed to N Division Islington with the warrant number 56101. I impressed my superiors and just a mere two years later was promoted to the position of sergeant. I was then reassigned to Y Division Highgate before rising to Detective Inspector on March 10, 1859. I was transferred three days later and placed in charge of H Division's newly formed CID branch at Whitechapel. From this position, I successfully solved the duel at Jacob's Island case in 1860 and the curse of the Gypsy's Kiss in 1861. In 1872, I was promoted once more to superintendent after successfully solving the mysterious case of the Silver Angel. The stories presented here are completely true and unravel themselves under a false veneer of Victorian morals, drowning in a sea of modernity. Each case brought with it a tide of technological advances for aiding in the apprehension of criminals, utilising breakthroughs in medical science, steam engines, electricery, balloon modelling, origami, gigantic vegetables and advances in jam manufacturing. This was all played out in front of a meta-narrative that embraced every aspect of Victorian society, including prostitution, gambling, smuggling, opium dens, child labour, degradation, dereliction, debauchery and alcoholism, as well as the more dystopic and darker aspects of life, like variety hall music acts, those small triangular cut cucumber sandwiches that seem so popular these days, entomology and the French. I retired from police work on February the 3rd, 1888, having received 82 commendations and awards. I'm now spending my semi-retirement writing from a small south-facing villa in Monte Carlo, where I find light distraction by working three days a week as a private enquiry agent for the European branch of the Pinkerton National Detective Agency of America. Each day now passes, I find myself hoping with all my heart that there will be crime in heaven. The Thief, the Spy and the Ice Lady A Northeastern Railway 060 long boiler locomotive waited resplendently on Platform 4 in its smart, shiny, leaf-green livery with black and gold trim, panting breathlessly in gurgles of anticipatory steam, ready to embrace the King's Cross station to Edinburgh Line. I paraded the concourse waiting for the unpunctual Officer Edward Wallace to arrive. Not many duties take me beyond the squalid square miles of East London, most of which the lost Officer Wallace was now traversing. He had spent an hour looking on his map for King's Cross station and found himself in Billingsgate Fish Market after some well-meaning misdirections from an uneducated, geographically redundant general populace. Where the blazes have you been? Sorry, Detective Inspector, I got lost, didn't I? What's that moving in your bag? It's a crab, sir. 
The train departs in two minutes. Hurry up, boy. I'd been charged with safely escorting Lady Connie Mengis back to her native Scotland. While residing in London, several failed attempts had been made upon her life as she went about her diplomatic duties. I had commandeered the services of Officer Wallace to assist me on my brief, as he had never left the East End of London before, and Mrs. Wallace had pushed most prominently for his attendance on this assignment. She felt that five days away from home, taking the fresh Highland hair, with its famed healing medicinal properties, would be very beneficial to her. He would also be carrying my fly fishing equipment. I convened in a carriage befitting of Lady Connie Mengi's standing and sat down. Lady Mengi's was a well-respected accurate of Princess Louise, the Duchess of Argyle. Lady Mengi's had a brilliant mathematical mind. She would spend exactly two-thirds of her day just thinking about fractions. She also possessed a patriotic passion for her native Caledonia and had done much to support the tourism trade between Scotland and England. Lady Mengis regularly promoted the accessibility of Scotland, generated by the newly installed railway lines. For anyone with sufficient income, a love of rolled oats in boiled water, and a passion for a cold, constant, precipitorial grouple. The compartment was fully occupied by Lady Mengis entourage. Drusilla Clackett was sat by the door opposite and was the spinster of the parish of Invernury and the aunt of Lady Mengis. She was her chaperone and took to her charge in the same way a lion applies itself to the carcass of a gazelle. She had a dour face like a forgotten tunnel and showed all the loneliness of a neglected olive in an empty glass of gin and tonic. Miss Clackett was renowned for having one of the worst personalities in Scotland and she was up against some very stiff competition. Her only achievement during a lifetime of despising was through her love of word puzzles. She was the all-open Scottish winner of the merging together of words, which must have been tremendous for her. Elgin McPuddock sat in the corner of the carriage dressed in a full red kilt and sporran, sporting a bright distasteful yellow garish smoking jacket with a lime green shirt. He had a constant frown on his face from knowing that if the nations of Portugal and Spain ever merged together, they would rename themselves Portugal. Thus the catalyst for his consternation came when England and Scotland became one nation and it was decided to call it England. He was the Scottish Minister for Agriculture and ran a wild haggis farm in Aberdeenshire. The Aberdeenshire haggis is a small ruminant quite different from the Highland haggis. The Highland Haggis has shorter legs on one side so its body can move more easily and traverse the hillsides. It has less fur and tends to dwell in one localised region. Unlike its cousin the kebab that migrates in large numbers across Turkey and is often found grazing on the ridges of the Kakar mountain range along the eastern coast of the Black Sea. McPuddock was the current Scottish combat country dancing champion after he'd used an impressive winning Strathsbury travelling step, combined with a move called the clothesline. This left his opponent with a fracture to the third vertebrae and a silver medal. He was an expert bagpipe player and studied music and inhumanities at East Stirlingshire University. My focus on this journey, though, was Lady Mengis, and she caught the eye in a shimmering baby pink gown that was styled off the shoulder to complement a delicate sheer shawl. Her pointed, solid, narrow waist bodice pushed everything up to meet a low, sloping neckline coming in the opposite direction. This had the effect of rendering her upper ventral region of her front torso into the resemblance of two rare plump-bottomed Yorkshire middle white piglets that had had the misfortune of being stuck in a fence after trying to squeeze their way through the same hole. They were whiter than a miller's apron and were as delicate and as luring as the finest Staffordshire porcelain. The kind you would wish to eat your dinner from. I sat there for a while thinking about some sort of liquid-based meal like a soup or a stew. I thanked each and every Irish navigational engineer that had misaligned a bolt on that railway track. 
as every minor jolt in the carriage left a mesmerizing flicker of motion, quithering on the bonded, pushed-up milky flesh. She rose and sank with each sweet, gasping, tender, diaphragm-squeezed breath. Like two poorly bored fishermen oh. hugging together on a bobbing coracle, tethered to a harbour wall and being pounded by the high metronomic ebb and flow of a seasonal tide. All that was missing from this imaginary tableau was the white foamy spume that would be splashed liberally in all directions, covering our two rounded seamen. Her delicate, soft, fingerless lace gloves allowed her nimble, dexterous digits to tease and tug a sewing needle backwards and forwards through the stiff stretched silk. She would place the needle in her pursed, pert lips as a course of habit whenever the train whistle signalled our imminent passage through a tunnel. It had become common practice for so-called gentlemen to plight their troth when an absence of light was created by the tunnel by making advances and assiduities towards young ladies in the form of a stolen kiss, with all the sexually alluring appeal of putting a tortoise in its box for the winter. In defiance of such a deviance, young ladies were taken to placing their sewing needle betwixt their lips in order to discourage such random acts of defiling. It is now a long journey for any overly enthusiastic man who virulently attempts to penetrate a young lady's personal space. Wallace was left sitting in the guard's compartment on several hairy Hessian mailbags with a collection of loose-fitting perambulators and bicycles, with a mug of tea so strong that his spoon stood to attention in it, without making its way to the sides. It had stewed on the engine footplate in a cast iron kettle and had been reheated continually in the furnace. And during the last 30 miles of any journey, the fireman and driver would have to take turns sucking it out of the spout. The buffet car that evening left me nursing a debilitating bloat that was achieved via a giant steak pie. It had a thick crust on it that resembled the Pennine Way and required the cook to adorn a kidney belt before retrieving it from the lower reaches of the oven, as to avoid fear of injury, with seasonal vegetables. This was accompanied by a dark, gaseous, frothy Scottish stout that had the aftertaste of licking a penny. Penny Eccleston was a very popular member of the Clerkenwell Police Department catering staff. The evening was thus filled with all the sensuous promise of a night of bilious pear drops and liver salts. I took to the bunk above Officer Wallace in a small claustrophobically airtight sleeping compartment. I settled down and started to light my trusty briar pipe. I stuffed it with a thick cut ribbon shag made from my own concoction, one part navy issue rum, two parts Syrian Latakia fire cured spice tobacco, and two parts burly. This was to help me relax my delicate imposition. Wallace sniped me inquired, Are you going to be smoking out all night, sir? No. And I informed him that after the Toft Green Junction at York, I would be farting the Bladen races. The Bladen races could best be described as a raucous marching waltz. Officer Wallace was also disposed of his lower intestinal tract muscle memory and was posturing for a long and lonely night, having been pressed upon the train guard and Mr. Horace Scheme to eat a roughly composed pea and mutton curry cooked on the fireman's shovel, using a recipe it brought back from the Indian Rebellion of 1857. He had also brought back a bad case of belly belly and a rather distracting hand-carved wooden articulated swaying snake that he scared schoolgirls with. Apparently, Officer Wallace regularly moves his bowels with clockwork efficiency at 8 o'clock every morning. Unfortunately, on this occasion, he did not rise until 8.22 a.m., after surprising himself into consciousness. Wallace could not touch his boiled egg at breakfast, and I pushed some loose scrambled eggs around my plate, not wanting to make eye contact. 
Just at that moment, during the darkness of our latest tunnel, a cry rang out from the direction of Lady Nengi's compartment. We made our way hastily up the corridor and burst through the door to her sleeping couchette as the light broke back into what was now a crime scene. We found Lady Mengis trying to unsuccessfully gather herself from the floor in a multi-layered muddle of blonde teaseled hair, corset knee-length shimmies, flounced petticoats, pantalettes, crinoline, and the flash of alabaster flesh. She appeared unhurt, but exclaimed her bustle had been slightly crushed, at which point I metaphorically slapped Wallace on the hand to stop him from prizing the lid off the innuendo jar. I did this by stepping into the carriage and bringing Lady Mengis to her feet, by aerating her nasal passages mm. with smelling salts. She appeared to be intoxicated and I could smell traces of whiskey on her breathless panting. She seemed very agitated and overly concerned that her diary had been stolen. I thought about arresting Lady Mengis on the charge of being drunk and disorganised, but thought this would only exacerbate her situation. Her early morning coffee had been spiked with the strongest Scottish whisky. Under normal circumstances, this would have rendered any fair young maiden unconscious. Unfortunately, our assailant was unaware that her father owned the biggest whisky distillery in the lowlands of Dumbartonshire, and she had grown up with a single cast malt in her nursing bottle. He would have required the same quantity of neat alcohol as the head keeper of the North American Mammal Section of the London Zoological Gardens would have required to have sedated a Midwest Plains alpha male grizzly brown bear, Ursus arctos horribilis. This showed a pronounced lack of foresight and planning on behalf of the criminal. Lady Mengis had briefly caught a glimpse of her attacker as the light broke swiftly back into her compartment as her assailant turned to leave. If only we had a random collection of silver nitrate glass plate slides depicting facial parts in various sizes to use in a composite image to manufacture a likeness of our perpetrator. Alas, a description was all we had to work with. A gentleman with spectacles, a large nose and a bushy moustache should not be hard to find. Our man would still be on board the train without any means of escape, so we went about systematically searching the entire locomotive. Lady Mingis was placed under supervision. A combing of the passengers on board did not reveal a single man fitting the description. We did, however, recover the stolen diary from the darkest recesses of the train guard's lunchbox. It had been skillfully deposited in the fold-up bed of his sleeping quarters. We also removed his bed linen and replaced it with our own. I flicked quickly through the well-fingered yellow mercurial pages of the journal. It is a compact concophony of drawings, equations, technical sketches and ink blots. To my untrained eye, it looked exactly like an important groundbreaking document outlining what would have theoretically offer as an insight to the informed into the conceptual making of heavy water. This is water that physically and chemically looks and acts like any other type of water, but contains a higher than normal proportion of an artificially added hydrogen isotope enriched with deuterium. The isotopic introduction changes the energy of the water's hydrogen and oxygen bond, altering its physical, chemical and biological properties. It looked like this was to be achieved by using Faraday's second law of electrolysis to place a direct electrical current to a non-spontaneous chemical reaction involving natural log water. This would separate the elements directly proportional to the atomic mass of the element when the appropriate integral divisor had been applied. Now, several questions now raised themselves in our inquiries. Firstly, why had Lady Mengzis lied about the nature of this document? Secondly, why was she attacked for these scientific notes? Fourthly, why was it found in the possession of the guard? And fifthly, what happened to thirdly? We quickly apprehended Horace Skeen the guard and further discovered a pair of forced glasses, a rubber prosthetic nose, a fake moustache and half a bottle of whiskey, 
all hidden under the mailbags in the guard's van. A deceit of the First Order had taken place. We handcuffed Mr. Skeen and took him to the secure carriage to unravel the mystery. As soon as we were alone, he informed us of the most cunning and bizarre tale I have ever encountered. Horace Skeen was not as he appeared. A letter adorned with the red sealing wax of Our Majesty was presented to us. It informed me that he was in fact a brigadier and a member of the Queen's Intelligence Service, and was thus acting on behalf of the Crown on matters of national security and interest. For many years, he had apparently followed, with undetected diligence, the movements of Lady Mengis. With the aid of several brilliant scientists with Scottish sympathies, Lady Mengis was constructing a plan to bring economic benefit to Scotland at the expense of England by luring tourists away from our fair and warm country by changing the weather in Scotland to tropical proportions. Brigadier Scheme was trying to intercept her plans for heavy water before they could get north of the border. Her devilish plan was to turn all the lock water in Scotland into heavy water, which is 11% denser than normal water, so they would hang low in the atmosphere during the evaporation process. This would make the heavy water-infused air sink and converge to create high pressure. This in turn would create a warm, dry, sunny spell as alien to Scotland as edible food. To facilitate this fanciful process further, it was believed that attempts would be made to call the sea off the Aberdeenshire coast by using sailing ships to drag a fleet of giant icebergs into offshore waters from the west coast of Greenland. A clockwise flow of air circulates over Scotland so that icebergs positioned off the east coast would allow the cooler air to work its way across the west side of Scotland before coming back around. Air masses are affected significantly by oceanic currents and colder seas would certainly facilitate their plan further. The beneficial side effect of this scurrilous scheme would be the creating of low pressure over England. As air flows from one pressure system to another, nature abhors a vacuum. It was hard to believe that Lady Mengis could hatch such a devilishly devious plan with her meteorological knowledge, and it was breathtaking, although I did recall her warm front giving me a ridge of high pressure. Brigadier Skeen had the proof he was looking for, shipping information on the back of the book, including schematics on tide times, map coordinates for ice flows, and shipping documentation were all in McPuddock's own hand, thus fully implementing McPuddock in the ruse. I thought an arrest would best be served after the train had arrived at its ultimate destination, as to not draw attention to ourselves and in respect for the social standing of our criminals. This was of course a capital offence and the hangman's noose would be waiting for our treasonous travelling party. The brigadier then went on to exclaim that this was solely a matter for the Majesty's government and that any interference from the police would also damage the symbiotic relationship between our two great nations, causing much antagonism and ill feeling, especially when other parts of the British Empire were already being placed under great pressure from various emancipated Aborigine people from around the globe. Now was not the time to have distensions on our own doorstep. Thus Lady Menzies was not to be apprehended and no mention of this incident would be made to her after our current conversation had ended. She must not be made aware that we were in possession of all the facts. The Brigadier however agreed that McPuddo could be apprehended in due course. I didn't care a fig for this plan and Officer Wallace felt uncomfortable in his obligation due to his unwavering scruples which did not allow him to be deceitful towards a lady. I then reminded Officer Wallace that when he passed lipstick off as an embarrassing heat rash brought on by ill-fitting rough standard issue police trousers and cycling duties last summer, no more was said on the matter. The brigadier then apologised for poisoning us in a bit to keep us away from Lady Mengis, long enough for him to perpetrate the manhandling of her to retrieve the documents something he had tried to do on several occasions back in London. 
I told him that it would be more fitting to offer his considerable humilities and condolences to the poor laundress of the North Eastern Railway Company that would soon be pressed into confronting our bed linen. This was a curious case where one has the proof, the suspect, and the knowledge that a crime was to be committed, yet does not instigate an arrest or press charges. The wills of justice move in mysterious ways, or sometimes not at all. Epilogue Lady Connie Menges was instantly removed from her duties and engagements, as her close links to the Queen's sister could prove to be embarrassing. She was placed in a far less prominent position, where she was to address meetings for the wives of the Scottish Farmers Institute. Her knowledge of advanced pectin extraction in jam production would prove to be inspiring. She was also latterly credited with the inception of the Scotch egg. After witnessing a haulage train carrying a cargo of pigs careering off the rails before crashing through a chicken farm in Fife and coming to a halt in a disused bread-making facility. Elgin McPuddock was arrested on the concourse of Edinburgh Station after Lady Menges had safely been escorted away. He was charged with the lesser offence of conspiracy to cause treason and served a lengthy prison term. Upon his release, he became a recluse after selling his shipping agency, but could occasionally be seen walking his mountainous land, adorned in a kilt, to check on the welfare of his free-range roaming haggis. On a clear, windy day, you could easily make out his small holding. Drusilla Clackett latterly gained employment at the United Strathclyde Dairy and Creamery by staring at cartons of full-fat pasteurised processed milk for the production of soured cream. In her retirement years, she campaigned vigorously, from a Presbyterian viewpoint, upon the dangers of excessive tugging. This was in light of numerous dislocated arm injuries sustained during the Highland Games, involving two teams of big burly men and an unspecified length of sturdy shipping rope. I love the Scottish summer. It's my favourite day of the year. A day where the rain is actually warmer. The fishing was sublime. I managed to hook a hefty pike. And Wallace surprised himself by getting an impressive chub on that I helped him wrestle for over an hour until it slipped away. According to Mrs. Wallace, if you give a man a fish, he has food for a day. Teach him how to fish and you can get rid of him for the entire weekend.